Neanderthals, Lucy, Homo erectus, the list goes on and on. Making sense of ape man claims this week on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Now, our topic this week is making sense of ape man claims. Mm -hmm. We've all heard a variety of names on the so-called scientific documentaries uh, and seen supposed ape to man progression pictures on t-shirts and, and right. uh, everywhere else pushing the evolutionary idea that humans have come from a so-called ape man right. that lived in the past. What are these fossils that scientists have found and how would a Bible-believing Christian, a creationist, explain them? That's our question. Yeah, I mean, there are many sometimes conflicting claims about so-called ape men. Right. Uh, fossil creatures alleged to be evidence for human evolution. And these hominids uh, are supposed to be our ancestors. Transitions linking us uh, from our, our common ancestor of both apes and humans. Now, whenever there's new finds, whenever they're, they're trumpeted in the, in the media and, and, and Etc. Uh, many wonder how uh, anyone could really deny that we evolved from ape-like ancestors. I mean, isn't each one of these new finds even more evidence of our evolutionary chain? That's the way people think. Yeah. Well, the big picture is actually very different and, and encouraging for the biblical creationist. For many decades now, with, with few exceptions, a consistent pattern has emerged. It's as if each find sort of switches on more pixels in a, in a grainy image, maybe sharpening but not changing the picture, which was always obvious in the outline anyway. Uh, all of the finds more or less naturally fall into two or uh, only three major groups. Mm -hmm. Two of these, Neanderthal and Homo erectus, are similar anyways. Uh, uh, both are clearly human descendants of Adam. Right. And virtually all of the others, including the famous Lucy, are in the remaining group, which generates the most evolutionary excitement. Right. But it, uh, it turns out to be an extinct non-human primate group, anatomically not between apes and humans. So future finds will almost certainly fall into one of these groups. So overviewing them here should equip us to uh, more readily understand how the next such uh, proclaimed human ancestor too uh, will, will likely fit into this big picture consistent with biblical history. Right, well let's get started. Looking at some ape man candidates uh, you've, you've undoubtedly heard of. Uh, let's start with Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. Artists' impression of Neanderthals have uh, most often depicted some really primitive subhuman ape man. However, the evidence that these were people that should uh, even share our species name is mounting. Right. So artist renditions are gradually shifting toward a much more obviously human appearance. Right. Neanderthals had more robust skeletons than most people living today and, and bigger brain cases. However, yeah. everything about them is consistent with regarding them as post-flood, post-Babel descendants of Adam. Uh, evolutionist Donald Johansson, discoverer of the famous Lucy fossil, uh, co-writes of Darwin's defender and friend, biologist Thomas Huxley, in this way. From a collection of modern human skulls, Huxley was able to select a series with features leading by insensible gradations from an average modern specimen to the Neanderthal skull. In other words, it wasn't quantitatively different from present-day Homo sapiens. Okay, now Huxley didn't believe that Neanderthals evolved into modern humans, but that they were fully human. Mm -hmm. The standard evolutionary view is that they were not a direct ancestor of modern people, but rather a side branch. Mm -hmm. uh, Huxley skills, uh, Huxley's skulls, uh, rather, made perfect sense if one sees Neanderthal as simply a part of the range of the bony variation in the human family. Yeah, many things show that Neanderthals were truly human. Uh, to start, sequencing of their DNA clearly shows interbreeding with modern populations, particularly those from Eastern Europe or Eurasia. So Neanderthals can't be a separate species despite evolutionary claims that they split off from the human lineage 500,000 years ago. Yeah. By the way, the evidence um, 
this evidence has been a major blow to, to progressive or old earth creationists uh, notions. Sure. Even the most ingenious manipulation of Adam's lineage can't stretch it to hundreds of thousands of years ago. Right. So because <laughs> such creationists accept secular dating as their starting point, they must regard Neanderthals as pre-Adamic, uh, soulless, non-humans, mm -hmm. despite all of the archaeological evidences of their humanity. But DNA now makes this completely dead in the water because yeah. they're having children together. It <laughs> means that they must have been the same created kind as us. Exactly. Uh, look at the former Russian boxer Nikolai Valuyev. He won several championships. He's the tallest and heaviest boxing champion in history at 2.1 meters or 7 foot 1 and 145 kilograms. Good guy. He's about 320 pounds. Now his robust uh, appearance and, and DNA uh, evidence reminds us that some of the genetic variation in humanity uh, ex expressed in these, these tough, robust Neanderthals is still prominent in Eastern European populations in particular. And not just him. Uh, WWE uh, superstar Brock Lesnar, former UFC light heavyweight champion Chuck Liddell, heavyweight champion Cain Velasquez, all of these guys have features that would be commonly associated with what people call archaic humans. But they're, they're as modern as you or I. Of course. And, and by the way, I'm not making fun of any of these guys here. Yeah. Uh, you know, many would say, they, look, they're handsome, rugged guys, etc. Um, but uh, these, one, one of the most accurate depictions of Neanderthals actually just looks just like Chuck Norris. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Neanderthals were just people, not some ape man ancestor, and we'll be back in a few minutes with more. Does the iconic Australian koala have its pouch upside down? This might sound like a silly question, but some biologists have claimed that the koala's downward facing pouch would work better if it faced upwards. They argue that the koala pouch is only facing downwards because of its alleged evolutionary relationship to a wombat-like ancestor. However, koala pouches work extremely well in their current orientation. When koalas climb trees, as they must do to feed, their bellies rub against the bark. If the mother's pouch faced upwards, it would fill up with debris. Moreover, the rear opening has soft tissues and a ring of muscles that hold the young ones in. The pouch also secretes antimicrobial proteins to make it nice and clean just before it's due to carry a new young one. Thus, koala pouches are well designed, not poorly designed, as you would expect from the master designer. They do just what they were designed to do. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Well, if you just tuned in this week, we're talking about making sense of ape man claims. That's our topic uh, here on the show this week. We just finished talking about why Neanderthals aren't considered ape man ancestors anymore. <laughs> Uh, but what about the Denisovians? Uh, some of you may have heard that. What, what about them? Right. The Denisovians recently discovered from DNA in a tiny finger bone in Siberia and a second bone from Spain, uh, regarded as a sister group to Neanderthals, they too appear to have interbred with moderns, particularly Melanesians. So the highly respected Professor Clive Finlayson, he's a leading expert on ancient humans and director of the Gibraltar Museum, he's an evolutionist, says that the scientific community will have to accept that the Denisovians, like Neanderthals, were like us, homo sapiens. So there's another one off the list. So what about Homo erectus? Okay, all right. Well, this group includes uh, Java Man, Peking Man, and Turkana Boy. A recent analysis from five skulls from a single erectus population in Demanisi Deman in, uh, in Georgia, that's near Russia, shows that they had the total amount of variation found in the African fossils assigned to three separate Homo species, erectus, habilis, and rudolfensis. So. Humans. Humans, yep. Yes, uh, Finlayson mentioned earlier refers to these fossils and uh, uh, refers to the fossils and those of the most recent Neanderthal modern human era as all part of a single morphologically diverse species with a wide geographical range. So he suggests that like Neanderthals, uh, Homo erectus also probably interbred with moderns. In other words, all of these are just people. Okay, all right. Some creationists, uh, with good cause, regard them as simply a variant of Neanderthals. Uh, even many evolutionists lump these first two categories into the one category of archaic humans. Right. Uh, humans, yes, but with some distinguishing bony features, uh, prominent among these being the robusticity in their skulls. A paleoanthropological uh, evidence from the Indonesian island of Flores indicates to 
the surprise of evolutionists that the Erectus people must have had uh, complex seafaring skills. Right. It's interesting. Uh, they were able to uh, reach and hunt on an island that was only accessible across uh, significant stretches of open ocean. It's hard, hard to picture ape man doing that, right? <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, and research at the University of Georgia in the USA has suggested that their Arculean hand axe, uh, this was a highly sophisticated hunting projectile. So in short, uh, both of these subsets of archaic humans are simply post-Babel descendants of Adam and Noah. Okay, yeah, the, the common belief that this bony robusticity is an evolutionary stage prior to what they call the modern gracile anatomy is overturned by the find in Australia of gracile skulls dated as older than robust ones. However, the frequent association of robusticity with the early post-flood era has led some creationists to suggest that it is somehow uh, genetically linked with the longevity, uh, now also thought to be genetic, uh, documented in the in the Bible, of course, in the pre-flood patriarchs. Right, but but the key point to our, our topic here today is that their total humanity should no longer be in doubt. Right. In, in fact, some evolutionary uh, evolutionary paleoanthropologists, such as the University of Michigan's Milford Wolpuff, have long been saying that neither Neanderthals nor Erectus should be labeled as species separate from us. Uh, they should be uh, just all be renamed Homo sapiens, uh, as, and then just described as they are. Are either robust or gracile, but just as we see today in, in right. populations. Yeah. Professor Finlayson, the evolutionist mentioned earlier, also said regarding uh, recent fossil and genetic evidence that we must abandon once and for all views of modern human superiority over archaic, or that's ancient, humans. The terms archaic and modern lose all meaning, as do concepts of modern humans, uh, modern human replacement of all other lineages. So, obviously, uh, though the professor didn't mean to support Genesis <laughs> history, he certainly does exactly that. Exactly. And we'll look into more of these uh, ape man claims uh, when we get back in just a moment. Fun. Looking for a single resource that totally destroys evolution? You need Evolution's Achilles Heels. Authored by nine PhD scientists, the Evolution's Achilles Heels project involved examining areas evolutionists feel are their scientific strengths, such as natural selection, genetics and DNA, the fossil record, and radiometric dating. Discover how these areas and others are actually massive scientific weaknesses for evolution. Get Evolution's Achilles Heels, the Evolution Master Blaster. Order your copy at creation.com. Welcome back. On this week's episode, we're talking about making sense of ape man claims. Right. Now, the next and final group uh, we'll see are definitely non-human. Though if we saw them today, we'd probably call them something like apes, um, but the, their anatomy was actually substantially different from both modern apes and humans, and definitely not, as will become clear, in between the two. They're not a in-between phase. Okay, well, the next category we're referring to is the Australopithecines. Uh, this includes virtually all of the rest of the alleged ape-man specimens in recent times. It incorporates the Australopithecines from the genus Australopithecus, uh, for example, the famous Lucy or Australopithecus afarensis. Which means, by the way, southern ape, which is a tip there. A little, uh, little hint, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it also includes the Twang Skull and Mr. and Mrs. Please yeah. uh, find uh, all what they call Australopithecus africanus. Also, Nutcracker Man or Australopithecus uh, paranthropus. And if you've taken a course in anthropology, these names will be familiar to you. If, if you haven't, they might pop up in documentaries or museum exhibits that, you're, that you might see. Right. Now, here's why the Australopiths don't qualify as human ancestors, um, like many of them, like Lucy, are, of course, claimed to be. Right. One, their limb bones um, were, were highly suited to life in the trees, not to the open savanna, as textbooks depict. So curved hand and foot bones, uh, long arms, uh, are, you know, indicate this. Two, as evidenced by CAT scans of the fossil skulls, which show the uh, orientation of the organ of balance, they did not walk habitually upright in the human manner. Lucy's kin uh, have, have also been shown to have had a, a locking wrist mechanism, which is typical of knuckle walkers, right? Okay. Yes, the upright walking claims are largely based on a set of bipedal footprints in volcanic ash, the famous Latoli prints. Uh, but as uh, 
uh, Dr. Russell Tuttle from the University of Chicago showed, they're indistinguishable from the prints of modern humans who walk uh, habitually barefoot. Uh, the only reason they were assigned to Lucy and her kin is because <laughs> the dating of the ash is more than 300, uh, 3 million, not 300 years, 3 million years, and, and modern humans are not supposed to have been around that, that early. So by the circularity um, that's quite common in evolutionary reasoning, right. the prints have to be made by the ancestors of humans, which then shows that the ancestors of humans walked upright, so go figure. Yeah. So. Now, uh, number three, uh, third reason why they weren't um, intermediates is most importantly, these creatures were overall not anatomically uh, intermediate between humans and apes. This is based on a detailed objective computerized analysis of multiple coordinates on their bony skeletons by a team led by the distinguished evolutionary anatomist Charles Oxnard, recipient of the Charles R. Darwin Award for Lifetime Achievement in uh, Physical Anthropology. The total anatomical coordinates of the three groups, modern apes, modern people and the Australopiths were plotted in a 3D morphometric space, as it was called. Uh, evolutionary expectations were clear. People should cluster uh, in a blob at one position in the space, apes at another, and okay. of course, Australopiths somewhere in, in between. between. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but Ox the Oxner team found something uh, quite different. Mm -hmm. uh, the anatomy of this extinct group of primates was overall further from apes and people than those two groups were from each other. <laughs> they did not walk upright, but had a unique rolling locomotion. Um, importantly, Oxner did not regard them as ancestral to people. For decades now, there's been one uh, um, variety of Australopith after another trumpeted as the latest spectacular find allegedly supporting human evolution, but nothing has changed the overall big picture. That's right. And it seems unlikely to change with any number of future finds right. of a uh, new variety of Australopiths or of archaic humans for that matter. The reason's pretty straightforward. The notion that humans evolved from ape-like creatures is simply <laughs> wrong. Okay. And we're going to have more about this when we get back. Helium gas is renowned for its ability to diffuse through materials quickly. Why is it then that we find an abundance of helium in certain rock crystals that it has not managed to escape from them? This has significant implications for the dating of rocks using radioactive decay. That's because helium is formed when some radioisotopes decay, and therefore lots of helium suggests lots of decay has occurred. Moreover, if lots of decay has occurred, it also suggests that the rock is very old. However, nuclear physicist Dr. Russell Humphreys realized that lots of helium trapped in the rock crystals that had not had time to diffuse out means that the rocks were actually young. Dr. Humphreys concluded that nuclear decay rates must have been dramatically faster in the recent past. And that is why rocks that are actually only thousands of years old are commonly wrongly dated using radioisotope decay as millions or billions of years old. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Our subject this week is making sense of ape man claims. That's the topic. Now, so far, we've come to see that all of the supposed ape men we've looked at so far fall into one of two categories, humans or ape-like creatures. Now, obviously, some evolutionists would disagree with us. Uh, what evidence would they try to show to refute that? Right. Well, let's take a look at one of the most recent exhibits uh, on human evolution shows. On the 18th of December in 2015, the British Museum of Natural History opened their new Human Evolution Exhibition. Okay. Now, as you walk through it, it of course begins with the usual assertion of the fact of evolution with a sign that reads this. The fossil record shows that the human family tree is made up of many ancient relatives and that ape-like ancestors evolved into us. Uh, most significantly, however, it goes on to say exactly who our direct ancestors were within this family tree is a subject of scientific debate. And this submission is reflected throughout the uh, exhibition. Great. Uh, speaking of the, the, the first display, museum uh, paleontologist Professor Chris Stringer commented, he said, well, we've attempted here to represent about 7 million years of human evolution on one diagram, and you'll notice a lot of skulls there with very different species names. 
but you'll notice also, unlike many of these depictions, we haven't joined them up with the <laughs> lines of their ancestors and descendants, and that's a reflection of the uncertainty about how those forms are related. Right. Awesome. Now, also significant is that the chart contains just two main groups, mm. one identified as humans right. and the other as Australopithecines, uh, nothing with, and, and there's nothing bridging them. Right. In other words, uh, in, 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 despite being there are, uh, there's a lot of different species, he's found it impossible to put them in an order showing a clear evolutionary uh, progression from right. ape-like creatures to, yeah. to man. Species such as uh, Homo neanderthalus, which is Neanderthal man, and Homo erectus, which is Peking man, are placed in the blue area and is, are described as humans with just one species. Homo sapiens in the subgroup, which is modern humans. Now, species such as Australopithecus afarensis and Australopithecus africanus are placed in the orange area, as described uh, and, and described, obviously, as, astra, as uh, australopithecines. Mm -hmm. As mentioned earlier, since australopithecine means southern ape, <laughs> one might reasonably, uh, reasonably conclude that all these different uh, species, collectively known as hominins, should be classified as either apes or humans <laughs> with no clear examples of something that's in between an ape-man right. type of thing. And, and you go further inside the exhibition, there's these reconstructions of the heads and faces of various human species, right? Homo sapiens, Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalus, Homo antecessor, Homo uh, heidelbergensis, and Homo floriensis. And what's so striking, however, is their similarity. Uh, rather than their differences, uh, they are all so clearly so very human. So in, in contrast, um, the fossil skulls of the Australopithecines, they're so clearly ape-like. Right. Again, where, where there are transitional forms linking Australopithecines to humans, uh, or actually, where are they? Yeah. Uh, toward the end of the exhibition, there is a full reconstruction of a Neanderthal man, leaving no doubt that despite all that's been said about this species in the past, the museum scientists understand him to be fully human. Yep. Uh, given their difficulties identifying a plausible evolutionary progression showing how Australopithecines slowly turned into humans, how can evolutionists be so confident that this is what actually happened? That's right. the question. Exactly. The answer has more to do with philosophy than science. <laughs> Evolutionists are committed to the doctrine of philosophical naturalism, the belief that everything can and should be explained only by natural processes. That's it. According to evolutionist professor Paul Davies, um, science takes it as its starting point that life wasn't made by a god or a supernatural being. It happened unaided and spontaneously as a natural process. So in a no-God mindset, well, evolution must have occurred somehow, even if we don't see the evidence for it, and he's redefined science to mean naturalism. Right, yeah. So what's the conclusion here? When you hear the next sensational evolutionary claim that they've just found a new ape man, you can rest assured <laughs> what they found is either the remains of a fellow human or the remains of an ape. Science once again shows that the Bible's history is true, uh, regardless of how evolutionists want to interpret the facts. And we'll be right back with our In the News section. That's going to be interesting. Stick around. Creation Ministries International focuses on the Bible's first book, Genesis, and the creation evolution issue. Many of our speakers are scientists with PhDs who, before joining CMI, were employed in various scientific fields. Creation ministry speakers go to churches, equipping and encouraging people with the message of the truth and authority of the Bible and its relevance to the real world. To locate upcoming CMI events or inquire about booking a speaker into your church, visit creation.com. Okay, welcome back. In the news, as we wrap things up here, uh, in the, here's, here's something, uh, it's often science things written in the news about dinosaurs and fossils and yep. evolution. That Always kind of an thing. evolutionary explanation. Always an evolutionary packaging that we get it delivered to us in. Uh, this is called, These Dinosaurs Like to Get Their Feet Wet. Uh, very interesting. Um, paleontologists have found what they believe is the biggest dinosaur site in Scotland, uh, one that indicates hundreds of huge footprints of plant-eating sauropods dating to around 170 million years ago. The discovery on the Isle of Skye, uh, on the the, the, the footprints there and the handprints 
is helping provide fresh insight into the huge long-necked animals which were the biggest of the dinosaurs. Uh, the land mammals that fed on plants, uh, this discovery often uh, this discovery offers the strongest proof yet that they weren't afraid to occasionally dip their toes into the water. That's the report here. <laughs> you know what's so funny is when I was a kid, they always depict the sauropods in water. Remember that? They'd always, because they said they were so big, Years they ago, need water to support they can't them. stand on land. So what is it talking about here? This Anyway, um, Tom Challens, uh, who took part in the discovery that was... Uh, uh, detailed in a study Tuesday in, in the Scottish Journal of Geology said in a statement, it's exhilarating to make such a discovery and being able to study it in detail. But the best thing uh, is this is only the tip of the iceberg. I'm certain Sky will keep yielding great sites and specimens for years to come. Okay, so they found all these things. Continuing here, scientists had long uh, had gone to Isle of Skye in April on one of their annual fossils trips and stumbled upon the footprints by chance. Heading back from a long day of fossil digging on the island's isolated far northeast, the team led by Steve Brissett noticed depressions, some as big as 27 inches in di diameter, in the rocks and quickly realized they'd found something significant. As we were walking back to the cars, we noticed a big depression in the rock, this platform of rock that juts out into the Atlantic. It kind of looks like a pothole. And so they just go on to describe how they, you know, realized pretty quickly that these footprints were uh, right. from sauropods and such. Now, as you go on, and we can uh, look at some of the other uh, things later here, you know, first of all, let's think about it. We've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dinosaur tracks. That's, yeah. that's unusual. Um, but what's really unusual is the fact that the dinosaur prints were preserved. I mean, here they're talking about where they weren't, you know, they were in a watery environment and their footprints have been reserved. I'm sure you've taken the kids to a beach. Uh, yes, yeah. And you walk down the beach and the footprints are there. The and question is, how do they get fossilized? Right. Why, how does that happen? Right, because we see this uh, animals doing this all the time, but... Uh, they, they don't get preserved. The water comes in, the water comes out, the footprints are gone. So how come there's all these hundreds of footprints and how come they're preserved? But anyway, uh, together with the animal tracks recently in other parts of the world, the sky tracks reveal that sauropods spent lots of time in coastal areas and shallow water. This is something I notice all the time. Okay. Whenever I see uh, um, these types of uh, claims is that, oh, supposedly this was an inland sea millions of years ago, i.e. there was water in the area. That's how the fossils get made, etc. Right. Uh, and we're not solely land-based. There have been previous discoveries suggesting this was the case, but Brousset said Sky was a slam dunk site that supported that theory. Okay, so they're in these shallow waters. Well, see, once again, this whole news article is packaged in an evolutionary way. But it actually right. fits with biblical history. Big flood, about 4,500 years ago, lots of creatures running for their life, lots of minerals in the water, great way to preserve all the footprints, yeah. great way to dis, uh, you know, understand this. So right. um, next week on Creation Magazine Live, the biblical basis for modern science. We'll see you then.